CEO of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. And I wanna thank you for joining our North Santa Cruz County Election Forum on Housing. As many of you may already know, the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership is a nonprofit member supported organization that works across our Tri-County region. Our work focuses on specific initiative areas that are the underpinning for a thriving economy, affordable housing, a strong workforce pipeline, ubiquitous broadband access, and climate change mitigation, which includes transportation improvements. Tonight's candidate forum is part of our advocacy and education work to help increase the supply of housing of all types and income levels across the region. MBEP has been doing these nonpartisan election forums for four years. Everyone is welcome and the hope is that the issues are discussed in a way that brings clarity to public policy. The mission of MBEP is to improve the economic health and quality of life in the region. These types of forums contribute to that mission. Increasing housing unaffordability impacts all residents and our communities need real solutions, especially with the economic impact of COVID-19 and the over 900 homes lost to the recent wildfires. So this is an opportunity for local candidates to share their housing goals with voters. As a reminder, ballots go out October 5th, so make a plan to vote now. I'd like to thank MBEP's housing team for engaging in Santa Cruz County, providing technical assistance to staff and others to help meet the region's housing goals. Some examples include the Harper Street project, which brought 11 units of affordable housing in Live Oak, the Dientes Community Dental Mixed Use Affordable Project in Live Oak, UC Santa Cruz Student Housing West, which will provide three, over 3,000 on-campus beds, and most recently, the Eret Circle Project in the city of Santa Cruz, which could result in up to 36 homes through infill development of an underused site. We have designed the forum to focus on key housing issues that need thoughtful leadership from our elected officials. Our goal is to provide this platform for candidates during this election and to help voters make an informed decision. Many thanks to tonight's co-sponsors, Santa Cruz County Business Council and Affordable Housing Now, and a special shout out to Robert Singleton and Tim Willoughby. Now I'd like to introduce Matt Huerta, MBEP's Housing Program Manager, and hand the program over to him. Matt? Thank you, Kate. Uh, really appreciate your leadership. And um, also want to have uh, Robert Singleton join me on camera here as soon as he's ready. Um, and also flash our agenda so that we can be ready to show that as well. Um, want to thank everybody for their time this evening. Again, uh, I want to double down on, on thanking uh, Mr. Tim Willoughby and the Affordable Housing Now crew. What we did was really try to put together a um, a set of questions and, and a program that would be fairly streamlined, but in very focused on uh, the housing agendas uh, of the candidates here in Santa Cruz uh, County, North Santa Cruz County jurisdictions. And it really took a team to, to do that and folks on the ground that understand the needs of the community that are, are grounded here, rooted here, and um, have been uh, advocating for more housing uh, at all income levels and especially uh, affordable housing. And so that's what we're talking about this evening. And um, uh, let me see here. I, I want to make sure we, we go through the housing agenda and I don't see it in front of me. How are we doing on, on that? Uh, no problem. So I, I want to just uh, review that for, for our audience here and, and keep, us, uh, keep us moving. Um, but in, in terms of, of what we're going to hear tonight, uh, we have our uh, Supervisorial District 1 candidates. Uh, we're going to start there. Um, we're going to hear from them for uh, two minutes, essentially, to open, and they have identified their uh, housing agendas in one slide uh, presentation. And then um, we're going to discuss the questions that we developed uh, that they did receive previously and answered. And we have a chart basically outlining what the responses are. And we're going to go through that uh, together and also hear directly from them in terms of any clarifications and then also a closeout. And that closeout period would, would last about three minutes. And um, we'll use that same format 
uh, for each jurisdiction, again, starting with uh, the supervisors and then uh, supervisorial district uh, um, election, and then go to Scotts Valley, and then Santa Cruz City, and then uh, wrap things up uh, with uh, a recap there with Robert and I. So we hope to continue moving along. We have a bit of an agenda to get through. We appreciate everybody's patience working with us. And um, I want to turn it over to uh, Robert to give us some more background on what he's been up to recently and, and how uh, we've been working together here uh, on this uh, forum. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, I'm excited to be here. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Robert Singleton. I'm the executive director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. Our organization represents the 85 or so largest employers in Santa Cruz County in advocating for economic and community vitality. We're really excited to be joining MBEP and Affordable Housing Now for, I think this is the third time we've joined together for a forum that explicitly focused on housing. Um, we're excited from the perspective of the business community because uh, housing is by, bar none been the most important issue and the most impactful issue on the business community for as long as I've been in Santa Cruz. So it's a little over 10 years. Essentially, uh, our local businesses care a lot about making sure we can develop enough housing in our community for the people who live and work here. Um, right now, it's really hard to attract and retain talented employees. The employees we do have are being forced to commute from further and further distances because of the high cost of housing. So increasing housing options, increasing housing affordability is a big priority of the business, business community and therefore the business council. Um, this is even more so now that with the impacts of COVID-19, the shelter in place orders, a lot of people not being able to go to work, struggling to make rent. Um, and then also with the recent uh, wildfires where we lost over 900 single family homes in Santa Cruz County just alone. So all of these make sure that housing is still an acutely important issue for our community to deal with. So uh, Matt already kind of went over the run of the show, um, letting you know that uh, we can't, or while you may be able to see and hear us, we cannot hear or see you. Um, we are gonna be uh, allowing time for each candidate to present their overarching vision of, for housing in the community in about two minutes. And they have a slide to accompany the presentation. And after all the candidates have presented their overarching vision slide, they'll each be given three minutes to explain their answers to a series of yes or no questions that we gave them in advance. So uh, once again, overarching vision for two minutes, followed by three minutes to discuss their yes or no answers and the matrix will be displayed on front of you. Um, this event is being recorded and broadcasted um, and all the information as well as the recording and the matrices regarding each person's answer will also be ava made available after the presentation. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it right over to Matt to help us uh, get to District 1. Thank you, Robert. And we're almost there to hear from the candidates. I, I do want to take a pit stop here and just recognize the tremendous champion that we have locally that recently retired. And it's just another thing that breaks all of our hearts because we can't celebrate her and her accomplishments appropriately right now. We're going to have to save that for later. But Julie Conway has just been an amazing champion for affordable housing. Uh, she has spent over 37 years uh, doing uh, this kind of work and mostly in Santa Cruz County. And we have the pleasure of her serving many different roles and again, retiring from the county recently. Um, you'll still probably see and hear from her. I understand she still uh, serves on the planning commission there in the city of Santa Cruz. And I'm sure will make her presence felt uh, going forward and continue to be part of the affordable housing efforts here locally. Just wanted to say thank you again, Julie, and uh, we look forward to seeing you out there. Thank you. And um, the next thing now is to uh, go to our Supervisorial District 1 race, and we want to begin with, uh, I think, actually, uh, super, current supervisor uh, John Leopold was not able uh, to join us in person. Um, but we were able to uh, obtain a short video fit to fit within the time frame that, that we're allowing here to, for opening comments, and we want to show that now for you. Hi, I'm Supervisor John Leopold, and I'm sorry I couldn't join you at tonight's forum. But I wanted to share this slide with you about how we work to prevent homelessness, protect our affordable housing stock, and produce more affordable units. When we work to prevent homelessness, it was my vote that allowed us to have a state-approved housing element uh, for the first time in 20 years. That, uh, that support 
uh, meant that we earned about $15 million in funds from the state that has been used for first time home buyer program and increasing amounts uh, for rent subsidies program. Building that infrastructure was critical as we faced the COVID crisis this year and I established a $1.1 million fund for rent and utility assistance. Next, we work to protect uh, affordable housing. We worked very hard over the last two years to protect uh, over 115 units that were sunsetting of their HUD requirements. Uh, next, we've changed our zoning around permanent room housing to turn old motels that had basically turned into housing uh, to have the legal zoning so they could be uh, maintained. Lastly, we're strong protectors of the mobile home rent control law, uh, which is the key to protecting thousands of units of affordable housing in our community. Last year, I wrote a new ordinance to make sure that uh, park owners could not close mobile home parks. Lastly, we work very hard to produce new affordable housing. Uh, that housing element and the strategy we use to keep money from the redevelopment agency has allowed us to build Shapiro Knowles, Aptos Blues, the St. Stephen's housing project. Next, we are using our land uh, to build affordable housing so we know the cost of land is very expensive. Uh, that has yielded uh, 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 18 units with Habitat for Humanity, 57 units with Midpen Housing, as well as a new health center and a new dental center. Lastly, we are changing our code around the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, which envisions greater densities along our transit corridor to provide a diversity of housing for people in our community. Thank you for having me here tonight. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, now we, we want to uh, invite uh, our candidate, uh, Manu Ponick to uh, join us. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone, for uh, organizing this forum here tonight. We're all here tonight because we know that everything in our community hinges on housing. As Robert says, it affects our ability to hire everyone from teachers to dishwashers to doctors. And uh, housing in Santa Cruz County today is the fifth least affordable in the entire world. That's because we have very little land to work with. And what we do have is utterly wasted because we're prioritizing housing or parking cars instead of housing people. And nowhere is that more true than in the unincorporated part of the county where supervisors have jurisdiction and where my opponent has maintained the status quo. Just look at some of the projects that have been approved recently. Portola Plaza. There is no plaza, there is no public space, and only one fifth of the land area, 20%, is actually being used for a building. The other four fifths, 80%, is parking. That's like taking one bite out of the apple and throwing the rest away. Now add to that a extremely dysfunctional planning department. We routinely charge people tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars and string them along for months or years on end just to do things like build a bedroom for their daughter or add an ADU for a loved one. This is the nightmarish dysfunction that my opponent presides over and it's got to stop. If my opponent gets another four years in office, you can kiss goodbye to working class families in Santa Cruz. This will exclusively, be, exclusively become a beach town for the wealthy. I believe that what makes Santa Cruz County great is our diversity. And that's why I'm committed to doing as much as possible to build affordable housing. I will embrace uh, new technologies like tiny homes on wheels and legalize them the same way that Santa Clara County has. I will uh, update our building code and follow the sustainable Santa Cruz plan, putting it into action to build walkable communities and prioritize housing instead of parking. And I will streamline our planning department, not only so that we can rebuild after the fire, but we can establish a new normal so that people who wanna invest in our community and who want to add housing are empowered to do so. Just, I hope that tonight you'll, you'll uh, ask the tough questions and look at who actually showed up here tonight. I did, my opponent didn't. And if you want a candidate that's gonna be a champion for affordable housing, I hope to see that other one to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Manu, appreciate that. And um, what we wanna do now is, is uh, outline the questions that uh, were presented to the candidates and then uh, view their responses. So we, we wanna see the, the questions here so that folks uh, get a good look and we'll, we'll quickly uh, review them together. 
The first one is uh, when the sustainable Santa Cruz uh, zoning changes come before you, will you support all density upgrades on potential sites identified for affordable housing in the county housing element? And just uh, to remind folks that the sustainable Santa Cruz plan does involve uh, essentially proposals for zoning code changes that would allow for higher density, particularly near transit and um, throughout the unincorporated areas of the county. So that's that's what's at stake and, and the, both uh, candidates did, did mention that as well. Um, number two, the 41st and Soquel site pitted housing needs against tax revenues. Will you give pre preference for housing projects proposing housing for that specific site? Uh, there was um, a proposal that uh, was recently actually approved that involved a, a Nissan dealership uh, for that site uh, to illustrate. Uh, number three, you can see that uh, survey question. The parking requirements uh, can cause problems for nonprofit housing projects competing for state funding. Would you support decoupling or modifying parking requirements for affordable housing projects? And um, we know that there's uh, a tremendous burden for uh, projects, both affordable and market rate, that need to account for huge costs to accommodate parking and parking structures even uh, versus potentially allocating those uh, resources and, and space on a site for more housing. So that, that's what's at stake there. Um, we also have a fourth question. Would you support a transfer tax that would support affordable housing specifically? And the idea there is that a percentage that would be based on uh, taking during the sale and uh, transfer of property that a, a small portion, a small percentage um, would go into a, a, a fund, if you will, that would be dedicated for more affordable housing. And number five, do you support the use of in lieu fees to satisfy inclusionary housing requirements? And uh, I think that kind of speaks for itself versus um, having uh, more options for, for uh, it to be essentially built on site. So which, which way would you want to go on that? So here's the responses. Um, and we do want to discuss this a little bit with, with uh, Robert and I. Robert, are you, are you on? I can't see. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I'm on. Okay, just want to make sure. So, what what are you thinking so far, Robert? When you see this chart, uh, what what comes to mind first? Well, I, I'm interested to see uh, the the major differences in the candidates are, of course, implementation of the Santa Cruz or the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan, um, as well as the transfer tax idea. But I think we would be remiss to not talk about the 41st uh, Avenue and SoCal project that was recently proposed, and kind of what the priorities for that site are moving forward. Appreciate that. So uh, again, typically we, we would hear from both candidates, um, but uh, Supervisor Leopold was not able to join us, uh, but we'll go right to, to um, uh, Manu Koenig and hear from him. And Manu, if you wanna uh, join us and then also use this opportunity, you have three minutes to uh, address any uh, clarifications, uh, add on here and also close out. Thank you. All right, thank you, Matt. Yeah, as, as Robert said, uh, one of the key differences here is uh, my opponent and, and my approach to the Sustainable Santa Cruz plan. I mean, let's keep in mind, that was a plan that was approved in 2014. And here we are six years later, it hasn't been put into action. And one of the key tests for it was, as Matt mentioned, this project at 41st and SoCal, where a Nissan dealership was proposed, uh, which was contrary to the Sustainable Santa Cruz plan's recommendation for a mixed use activity center. Mixed use, of course, means commercial and housing. My opponent approved down zoning, the, the zoning for that lot, uh, to build the Nissan dealership. I would have been in favor of up zoning so that we could build uh, more housing and commercial, of, of course, as well on that site. And so I think that's the big difference here. You know, he's. Um, my opponent can talk all day long about how he supports the sustainable Santa Cruz plan, but he's had six years to implement it, hasn't done it, and it's the biggest test of that plan voted contrary to it. Uh, you know, I'll just mention, you know, I think that a couple of you, as you see here, the, uh, I, I wrote my statement before seeing the questions that MBEP had tonight. And I think you can see that we're very much uh, in tune because I, uh, questions are centered on parking uh, and 
uh, we're creating more affordable housing and, and density bonus type uh, efforts. And that's exactly what I was speaking to. Um, you know, I mentioned that mentioned the, the transfer tax for affordable housing, uh, of course, being another key difference here. Um, you know, I just don't believe that we should be arbitrarily uh, imposing new taxes on the process for trying to build housing. Uh, you know, I think that really the best solution is going to be in enabling lots of people to participate in the housing uh, process and, and building the housing our community needs. So, uh, you know, I'd much rather see a tax that um, help to preserve housing for uh, people who live and work in Santa Cruz. That, that's a tax that, uh, you know, the tax itself has a function. Just taxing the transfer of real estate uh, doesn't do anything positive uh, other than sort of slow down the process by which properties could be acquired and uh, transformed into more affordable housing units. And so, you know, I just want to finish by saying, you know, you, let's look at the record. My opponent has had 12 years to build more affordable housing. And over that time, our county has not met its uh, uh, affordable housing goals once. Not once. He's trying to take credit for, yeah, 57 units of affordable housing that were just approved on Capitola Road. He was talking about that during the last election, four years ago. It still hasn't been done. He voted against Habitat for Humanity. He voted for a Nissan dealership. And he voted against the Affordable Density Bonus Program. I'm, I'm running not against his endorsements, and, but against his terrible record on affordable housing. So, um, you know, in conclusion, that uh, we, we really need to do things differently. If we doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. Uh, I see these problems loud and clear. They affect my family, they affect my friends. Many of my friends have either moved away from Santa Cruz County or uh, are still renting late into their 40s because they can't afford to, to uh, live here and uh, become owners here. And that's what I hope to change to make sure that Santa Cruz remains a diverse and vibrant community. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate you joining us this evening. And um, please stick around if you can and uh, enjoy the, the rest of, of the event. Um, thank you for your time. And now we're going to move to uh, Scott's Valley candidates. Uh, and Robert, please uh, take it away. Great. Thanks, Matt. So for Scott's Valley tonight, um, unfortunately, uh, we are only going to be joined by one candidate, um, the incumbent, uh, Jack Dillis. So uh, Jack has been in council for about four years now. Um, Jack, I would be, uh, I, I should probably chide you and, and ask, I, I hope that your attendance at council meetings is a little better than at the forums. Um, but uh, I also totally understand uh, right now, Scotts Valley is going through a very difficult time. Uh, as many of you know, uh, much of the city was evacuated during the uh, CZU lightning complex fires. So uh, as a community, it's gone through a, a lot in the past month. And so we want to be respectful of that, but we are very excited that Jack was able to join us tonight and are excited to hear his vision for housing. So Jack, take it away. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good evening. I am Jack Dillis. I'm running for re-election to the Scotts Valley City Council. You know, Scotts Valley, um, yes, we have been through a lot, but we didn't have the fire hit our city. And I thank all of our, uh, our first responders for keeping us safe. Certainly, I'm happy we didn't have to go through what the San Lorenzo Valley folks have gone through and I, I know uh, we think a lot about them. So, But Scotts Valley needs new housing for workers and is a place for our young people to live. New housing and the valuable construction jobs that go with that provide a boost to our city's economy. At the same time, there is a need to protect the quality of life in Scotts Valley. We have a beautiful small town full of recreational opportunities and a small town character. We need to be cautious as more homes are built because our staffing is very low and our share of property taxes is very small, six and a half percent of what folks pay. So it's really hard for us to provide those services. So we really need to be careful about how many homes get built to the extent we can, we can manage that. So I see appropriate home construction as a balance between promoting economic development, meeting housing demand, and maintaining Scotts Valley's small town character. My approach to meeting the need for new homes is twofold. First, I'd like to see the city expand the inclusionary zone, which provides that for any housing developments, they have to provide 15%, at least 15% affordable units. But that only covers part of our city. 
It covers our two main corridors, the Mount Hermon Road corridor and the Scotts Valley Drive corridor. I'd like to expand that to the city limits to, to expand our uh, affordable housing stock. Secondly, I'd like to encourage interested homeowners to add an accessory dwelling unit or ADU on their properties as a rental investment. This would add rental housing units of which almost none has been built in recent years. We've been building for sale homes, but not, not for rent. Uh, in a way that this would not overwhelm our small town. Again, we're, we want to be cautious about um, staying a, a small town. This would provide an opportunity for homeowners to both increase the value of their homes and to receive rental income. We're at time, Jack. Be, okay. Um, and it would also be a win for renters and tenants. I'll stop. I'm sorry, renters and owners. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll give you some clarification time. Uh, if we can move on to our supplemental questions. So again, we would have loved to see uh, some more candidates come participate, but Jed, Jack, you just get to Florida to talk about your vision. So um, the questions we asked you in advance uh, were, uh, should a new proposal for the town center, um, should a new proposal for the town center come before council, would you approve it if 60% of the building's square footage was for housing? And so for those of you who don't know, uh, Scotts Valley has been debating uh, the future of its town center for oh uh, a while now, uh, I want to say at least 10 years, probably more. Um, and the main sticking point has been, what is the ratio of commercial to uh, residential space? Uh, next question. Uh, so would you support policies that dramatically and meaningfully increase housing stock in your city in response to having lost more than 900 single family homes in the San Lorenzo Valley right next door? Pretty self-explanatory. Accessory dwelling units provide many affordable housing units in cities like Scotts Valley, where there are few apartment complexes that have smaller units. Would you support what many cities have done in creating restrictions on the number of ADUs that can be used as vacation rentals? Also pretty self-explanatory. Scotts, Valley, Scotts Valley's inclusionary ordinance does not currently produce enough uh, very low and low income affordable housing units. It does not apply to swaths of the city, as you mentioned uh, in its general plan. Uh, uh, would you champion an overhaul of the ordinance? And then would you support efforts to upzone for duplexes and fourplexes in areas currently zoned for single family homes? So these are the questions that were asked of Jack beforehand and if we could see his matrix. So you abstained on the first one regarding the town center. So we definitely wanna hear more about that. Um, we've heard your response on ADUs. Um, and then in terms of supporting upzoning for duplexes and fourplexes, it's interesting you answered no here. So I would personally love to hear more about your answer there. Of course. Um, first on the town center project, I spent at least 25 years. I worked for Scotts Valley in the mid nineties uh, and it was being discussed at that point. The city has tried uh, through, so it's, it's not for lack of trying to make a project happen, just a variety of reasons that it has not advanced we, in 2008, we, uh, the council uh, adopted a specific plan for the, the town center project area and the surrounding area. And I think it's time to reimagine something different. So I wanna keep an open mind. Clearly we need some housing. And in fact, we have an obligation um, because of the, the money we took to, uh, um, to purchase one of the lots uh, there that the city owns, we have an obligation to build affordable housing. So we will include some affordable housing. Um, but I want to think outside the box, do something new. What we've been doing just has not worked. And clearly, retail is, uh, as a mixed use project, retail is, uh, is, is really being tougher than, than ever. And I suspect it's going to continue to be that way and get worse. So um, I don't have the answer, but I'd like to, uh, to explore things like uh, a convention center, which I think has been looked at at some point, uh, and something to build on Scotts Valley's brand that we haven't really established. But the idea that Scotts Valley is an outdoors oriented place, a gateway to the mountains, I'd like to build on that and see if we can get some good economic development around that concept and fit in um, affordable housing. Regarding, um, let's see, Regarding, uh, uh, I'm not sure you mentioned it, Robert, but the, the concept of helping out San Lorenzo Valley, which I would love to do in the uh, in the short term, uh, to to assist anything we can do with our with whatever we could do, but I'm not in favor of of building permanent homes 
for something that may very well be a, a several year issue for the, the poor folks that, that have suffered through that. Um, ADUs as it relates to, uh, to this, this issue of, uh, of uh, vacation homes, vacation rentals, uh, our ordinance does not allow vacation rentals. And I know they happen anyway, but, but we get almost no complaints so from anybody, so really, we don't really have an issue at, at this point on, on that issue. On the upzoning for duplexes and fourplexes, I'm concerned about uh, being such an incentive to development that we would see a lot. I mean, massive uh, attempts to buy property and to develop uh, a lot more units and overwhelm our town and really change the character of it. Again, I know we need housing, but for me, that's, that's not the way to do it, to keep our, uh, keep our town uh, small and keep the character that most people in Scotts Valley want to keep. Gotcha. And thank you so much, Jack, for joining us and for your, for your thorough answers. We really appreciate you being here. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt Huerta for the, for the Santa Cruz City Council. Again, Jack, thanks again. You're welcome to stay and enjoy the rest of the show. We're glad yeah. you could join us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Jack. So keeping us moving, we have a few candidates here that we want to hear from for Santa Cruz. Uh, that will be our final jurisdiction this evening. Um, we want to first uh, let you know that uh, we did reach out to all candidates. Everybody got invited and um, only one candidate was not able to be present today. Uh, but we will start with Elizabeth Conlon. Elizabeth, please uh, join us on camera and uh, present a, for two minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Conlon. I'm a scientist, renter, and housing advocate with Santa Cruz EMB. Housing policy intersects with the most pressing issues facing our community, racial and economic inequality, homelessness, education, and climate change. I'm running on a bold pro-housing platform to tackle the housing crisis by building more affordable and middle-class housing while also protecting renters. My six policy proposals are one, partner with nonprofit developers and use city-owned land downtown for 100% affordable projects. Two, implement an affordable housing overlay based on Cambridge, Massachusetts, recently um, recent zoning reform proposal to streamline affordable housing permit approval and allow increased densities for affordable projects, thereby reducing their costs. Three, gentle density. That means upzoning citywide for fourplexes in order to provide missing middle housing. That's housing for middle class families who may make too much money to qualify for deed restricted affordable housing, but are still burdened by the city's high housing costs. This is also a multi generational family friendly policy. Four, I would approve a mixed commercial, mixed residential, and mixed income housing projects in the pipeline. Five, the city is extremely limited in the affordable housing it can directly support. So I would build a coalition for a 2022 ballot measure for funding. And six, tenant protections are an essential component of our housing strategy. I would support a rental registry to understand rental costs and increases and evictions in our community. We need to make data-driven decisions about rental policy. I would also restore free legal service to tenants to enforce the state rent cap and the just cause eviction provision. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, appreciate it. And now we want to uh, hear from uh, Kayla Kumar, please join us. Yes, hello everyone. Um, so I'll set the table first. My approach to the housing crisis consists of focusing on the most acute shortages and alleviating the stress for those experiencing the greatest degree of housing insecurity and working out from there. Our current shortage, of course, according to the RENA numbers, exists along the very low, low and moderate income levels. This amounts to shortages in housing for service workers, teachers, hospitality workers, the average everyday working person and family who make Santa Cruz tick. In terms of policy, I submit to you short, middle, and long-term solutions I align with. In the immediate environment, my housing agenda involves a deep dedication to keeping tenants and homeowners housed. If predictions are true and these destabilizing, this destabilizing period extends past February 2021, 
I will advocate to maintain an eviction moratorium until all income levels are stabilized from the pandemic. I will also advocate to allocate more public resources to rental assistance programs while directing that these funding streams are continually refined to ensure that they are reaching those in the most need. In the middle term, we need an extra layer of protection from unproductive land speculation that shrinks our housing stock. One way we could do this is through a vacancy tax, an economic tool that applies a fee on units that sit on the market unused as a means of generating speculative wealth instead of housing a family or a business. Vacancy taxes are proven to dissuade this unproductive behavior and bring units off the speculative market and back onto the housing market for all income levels. Revenue enhancements generated from it could go to the Affordable Housing Trust to create more affordable housing. The North Star really though, throughout all time horizons is the creation of affordable housing through the process that is cognizant of the actual shortages that exist in Santa Cruz. The 3P model calls us to endeavor towards strong tenant protections, preservation of affordable housing, and of course it's production. And I think I'm out of time, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to hearing more from folks in the next segment. Um, and now we wanna hear from Kelsey Hill. Please join us on camera. Hi everyone, my name is Kelsey Hill. I'm a renter in the Seabright area. Housing is a critical tenant to my platform. As a council member, I'm committed to working with my colleagues to ensure that we are doing everything we can to meaningfully invest in housing that is accessible to folks at the lowest income levels. I wanna take a three prong approach as laid out here. Uh, we want to stabilize housing to keep people housed, produce more affordable housing to combat this crisis, and invest in innovative approaches that create long-term affordability for the residents that are most deeply impacted by the lack in high cost of housing. So one, we want to stabilize housing. I'm glad that the state has expanded the eviction moratorium and will advocate that it is extended after it expires on the local level. And then we need to ensure that renter protections continue and that people have reasonable means to make rental payments when they can to keep undue burdens away from mortgage holders and property owners and work with small landlords on rent payback plans. I'm also interested in partnering with local lending institutions to buy mortgages to help homeowners through the duration of this crisis and into our recovery. Two, we need to increase our affordable housing stock. We need to use city owned land to push for 100% affordable deed restricted units. On council, I will negotiate for the deepest affordability possible in all new developments. I also echo sentiments expressed around streamlining ADU developments. I wanna support the decoupling of parking and housing as a tactic to also increase access to housing. And three, we need to support the long-term innovative solutions uh, to housing by uh, investing in deep affordability and community engagement. We can expand access to home ownership through tenant opportunity to, pur to purchase acts, AKA TOPAs. Um, I'm a big proponent of community land trusts and believe here in Santa Cruz, we have fertile ground, even if not a lot of it, to explore and invest in the progressive approach to create permanent affordable housing with community buy-in. This is especially important for protecting affordability for BIPOC POC communities and keeping that affordability locked in for generations. I'm also enthusiastically supportive of public banking and excited about the housing benefits that could bring to our region. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kelsey. And now we wanna invite uh, Maria Cadenas to join us. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us here today. I appreciate it. My name is Maria Cadenas. I'm a candidate for the Santa Cruz City Council. And I believe strongly in affordable housing and making sure that people have a home. Really, that is the goal that we should be aiming for. And we're talking about our neighbors that are currently overcrowded. We're talking about the grandchildren that want to grow up near their grandparents. And while there is no single solution to the housing crisis we are facing, I believe that we can work together holistically to address it. I have, I have had the privilege to work on the development of housing for children aging out of foster care and to serve on the board of New Way Homes. I believe that we must retain all affordable housing we have and ensure that tenants are protected, especially now during the pandemic. In addition, I believe we need to build housing across income levels, specifically low income and extremely low income, as well as for the middle class. This is to ensure that we have a housing job fit in our market, and it allows us to make sure that we can continue to thrive as a city. Secondly, I believe we need to work very strongly with regional partners to increase funding for housing development from the state as well as federal sources in order to meet ARENA goals. 
And lastly, I believe that we need to identify Paul's additional revenue sources and innovative ways to partner with nonprofit developers to ensure that we can develop the affordable housing that we need. And, and lastly, and most importantly, we have to ensure that as we do this work, we do not put the burden of density solely at the, at the low income and communities of color of our city. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for joining us. Next, we wanna hear from uh, Martin Watkins. Please join us. Great, thank you so much for having me. So I wanna start with a quote, promoting prosperity while protecting the planet and the World Green Building Council. Um, housing solutions are climate solutions. And this slide really spoke to me because I believe that we as policymakers can think about development through a lens of sustainability. The World Green Building Council highlights that we can decouple economic growth from climate change, poverty, and inequality. And I was asked to share a slide that is about my vision, and this is my vision. I believe that green buildings can contribute towards making Santa Cruz a sustainable city and establish a process that provides opportunities to save energy, water, reduce carbon emissions, while creating good paying green careers and jobs. Green buildings are not only good for the environment, but they also support healthier, happier, and more productive lives. And by design, they improve the living experience. And to make this happen, I'll continue to advocate for low income home energy assistance funding, energy efficient investments, climate resilient infrastructure, and prioritizing low and moderate income neighborhoods, as well as solar installation and other green technology. And we can continue to update our planning processes like the recent electrification policy to ensure that we are building green buildings. And I'd like to also explore passive housing being built. And I, I will just say as a current city council member, I value a diverse population and I, devout, I value multiple housing op options and affordable housing. And I served on the housing blueprint subcommittee and at which time we gathered community input to identify ways to preserve our current affordable housing to create more affordable housing all the while maintaining our community's vitality. And throughout this entire process, we integrated community engagement and um, outreach uh, from the on onset. So we ensure our community is involved in our decision making. I, so we as a city spent uh, a number of months working on this document and I would like to use that as the foundation to our housing solutions. And I'll share a little bit more about that later. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Now we wanna to go to our next uh, candidate, Sandy Brown, please join us. Uh, Matt, hi, I see Sonia slide up, so I, you, you might wanna have her go before me. She's here. Huh, can, can we put Sandy Brown's up or, there we go. Thank you, Sandy, sorry about that, please oh. go ahead. All right, uh, so I turned my camera and my sound on. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. All right, uh, so I am, uh, my name's Sandy Brown. I'm running for re-election to the Santa Cruz City Council. Um, I, my um, strategies for affordable housing and community stability, and I really wanna highlight community stability as part of uh, this uh, overall project that I, uh, I think that, uh, and these arenas that I think we can uh, move into. Um, and so I, and also some of the things that um, we have done that I've, I've taken a lead on and um, wanna continue to work on moving forward. So the first one uh, speaks directly to community stability. I um, absolutely supported the city's eviction moratorium. I attempted uh, to get that uh, adopted by the city as the council as a longer term uh, uh, moratorium. I was unsuccessful and um, so I'm really glad to see that the state has done that and we are um, you know gonna have a lot of a co more conversation about how to proceed in that arena. I also want to uh, comment here that um, I as I've been walking around the city and talking with voters I have heard so much about uh, concerns from homeowners uh, who really feel like the city has a singular focus on high density, high end housing construction right now. And they, many of them have 
had issues through the rental inspection program with you know their units being abated, people losing their housing, renters actually losing housing. And that's a pretty significant number. I too was on the housing blueprint and we learned a little bit about that, um, but I think it's much more extensive than we are even aware. Um, so I think that we need to address that. We need to look at the rental inspection program. Um, so inclusionary zoning and replacement housing, I think I've talked about those uh, many, many times, but I let, took the lead in increasing our inclusionary zoning percentage to 20%. I'm looking forward to that um, producing more affordable housing in the future. Uh, partnering with affordable housing developers to build on city property, I think we're all supportive of that. I wanna add um, that we could use some of those smaller properties for land trust uh, partnerships as well, and a vacancy tax, which I can talk about later. Thank you, Sandy. Now we want to uh, hear from uh, Shebra Kalantari Johnson. Please join us. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in this forum. Um, I'm running for Santa Cruz City Council because I care deeply about equity, dignity, and compassion. And there isn't a better way to integrate these values than by addressing housing. Um, I can't do this topic justice with just a couple of minutes, but here are a few things to consider. A range of affordable housing options are needed to meet the needs of very low, low and middle income residents. Uh, siting is important to make this happen. So uh, as a city, we need to inventory available land that's held by churches and schools and nonprofits or individuals for affordable housing projects. Uh, we can prioritize mixed use, higher density affordable housing in, in our planning for our city owned land. And in particular in our downtown area, um, for example, surface lots um, in our city and explore our current library site. Uh, we can also expedite and streamline our permitting process and provide incentives for ADUs. It's also important to work with the university um, to, to look at ways to provide new housing units on campus for additional students admitted and new staff and faculty members that are hired. Now, in order to do all of this, um, we need ongoing sources of funding. I supported Measure H two years ago, and when we come out of this recession and the time is right, we as a community need to pursue this type of ongoing source of funding. This will open up more state and federal resources, which I have proven to um, secure through my grant writing work. All of this takes vision, planning, cross-sector partnership, and execution. Most recently, I've done this with my work on youth homelessness. I secured a federal grant that brings in over a million dollars a year continuously into our community to fund youth homelessness programs. And in the last months, I co-led the county COVID emergency response team to find safe shelter and place site for these youth. Housing's connected to many other community issues from youth homelessness to climate action to overall community well-being. My vision for Santa Cruz is a healthy, diverse and inclusive community in which all of our residents can live with dignity. And I know that this is a hard task, but I know that together we can accomplish this. Thank you. Thank you, Shebra. Appreciate you joining us this evening. Uh, and our final candidate that we will hear from for the opening comments is uh, Sonia Bruner. Please join us on camera. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, my name is Sonia Brunner and uh, Santa Cruz faces a severe housing shortage, especially in the area of affordable housing. Rent growth has outpaced income growth in Santa Cruz and data in the last couple of years shows that most Santa Cruz County residents are severely cost burdened. Uh, even among middle income households, housing consumes a larger share of income than 20 years ago. And so in order for Santa Cruz to thrive, we need housing that is affordable and equitably available in a variety of types, including micro apartments, condominiums, fourplexes, to accommodate the various needs of all of the people across a full range of incomes. And I, I love to give the example of young adults just starting out, that includes people like my son who's 25 and um, trying to uh, you know, afford to live here in the place he was born and raised. And our middle income workforce of teachers and public servants to be able to live here in the community where they work and seniors who 
who are on fixed incomes and really need to feel secure in their housing and not feel mm -hmm. they have to move away. So, um, you know, the impacts of COVID-19 and the CZU lightning complex fire crisis have really put us in even more desperate need for more housing options. And we're really in crisis times and people in our community need to feel supported. In the short term, we need to keep people in their homes. And the long term, my focus will be on thoughtful, balanced priorities that support development of equitable and affordable housing throughout the city, while also being mindful of environmental impact, strain on infrastructure, sustainability, and keeping our Santa Cruz charm. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks for joining us and you'll, uh, everyone, including you will have another two minutes to um, clarify additional questions, the questions that are about to come up and uh, discuss any differences as, as we highlighted earlier. Uh, Robert, why, why don't you take us through the questions uh, so that it's clear to the audience what was presented to uh, the, co the candidates and um, set up any questions that you feel might need a little color to them. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. All right, well, let's review the questions that the Santa Cruz City Council candidates were asked to, uh, to answer tonight um, in the matrix form. So uh, first one is two councils have voted to move the library mixed use project forward. It includes 55 uh, affordable housing units, uh, creates an opportunity for affordable units on the existing site and makes nonprofit builders chances of securing funding better, better for the Metro and Pacific station projects that include at least uh, uh, 80 additional units. Would you vote uh, to continue moving forward with the project. And that vote was cast, uh, the most recent council vote was cast, uh, I believe in June of this year. Next question. Inclusionary projects provide both market rate housing that addresses the imbalance between demand and supply and almost annual additions to the number of uh, affordable units. Will you support inclusionary projects conforming to the existing inclusionary housing ordinance that includes a 20% requirement? Incentives like density bonuses and building standard concessions like setbacks and par parking modifications. Santa Cruz has a limited, uh, limited number of building sites for affordable housing. The council approved and staff applied for state funding to restart the process of amending the general plan for the corridors, also known as the corridors plan. Would you support continuing the process and vote for changes that allow for more sites and greater density along the corridors in the city limits? The State Tenant Protection Act of 2019, AB 1482, created rent increase restrictions, further defined and added tenant protections, and expended, expanded the number of units that come under the law to what will be authorized by Prop 21 should it pass. Do you want the city to create its own renter protection or rent control ordinance with additional or different provisions than the existing state legislation? And lastly, California Senate Bill 1120 which was considered by the California legislature but did not succeed, would have allowed duplexes on currently zoned single family home lots. Similarly to SB 50, which would have allowed upzoning in areas proximate to transit on a statewide basis. Uh, many cities with limited land like Santa Cruz are considering that change. Would you support this kind of upzoning for Santa Cruz? So in general, um, the candidates had, had differing answers to some of these questions, which we'll highlight uh, before. The question I'm most interested in uh, is that a lot of our candidates have talked about uh, the ability to develop 100% affordable projects on city owned properties. The library project is one of those potential projects, but there's a difference in terms of how the candidates have answered in the support of that project. So I'm most interested in hearing more about that. Matt, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And when we look at the chart and, and see, you know, yes is across the board, obviously might point to something in terms of the, the likelihood of supporting a potentially stronger um, overall housing agenda, but e each question, each issue is kind of, it's got its own unique, um, you know, aspects to it. And like you're saying, the library proposal has been such a, uh, a challenging uh, project and very hotly contested and lots of subcommittee meetings and uh, lots of, of uh, energy around that. If we, you, we see the part, to the part one and part two. So you can see from the chart, there's part one and part two and where the candidates line up, there's four on each slide. Um, so we'll toggle back and forth a little bit so that folks can see 
clearly um, how how each responded across each uh, of the, qu the the key questions here. Um, yeah, no, I, I think uh, it, it's fairly clear that that uh, you know renter protections is is um, very important, uh, obviously. And we want to look. Let's look at that part one again. I want to look at that. There you go. So you can see many yeses there. And I guess I would I would also want to hear from folks that weren't able to kind of answer the questions clearly with a yes or no. Obviously, abstentions kind of beg the question: Are you, are you really against something for something? Maybe there's it's a, it sounds like it's a depends uh, issue, but sometimes folks just don't have all the the uh, information at hand to decide one way or the other. So I think it'd be great for candidates where they answered uh, with abstentions to clarify. I also have one more common uh, or one more consideration I'd like to give the candidates before we turn it over to them, which is also about the corridors plan for the city of Santa Cruz. For those of you who don't know, the corridors plan was uh, a plan to develop greater density along the four main transportation corridors in the city of Santa Cruz. Those were uh, Mission Street, Ocean Street, Water, and SoCal. Um, it was a controversial plan um, and was recently reset by a former council. Um, and so, uh, but given that it is a priority for infill density um, near transit, love to hear the candidates take on that particular plan. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, no, that, that's certainly a, a huge issue. And I think um, points to even uh, Monterey Bay Economic Partnership recently this past year, we actually created a, and launched a climate change uh, initiative because there's just so much uh, connectivity and synergy with transportation issues and and um, climate change and linked to housing and where are we going to put housing where where do we um, you know grow and there's just a lot of, of uh, uh, agreement that if it's got to go somewhere then it needs to go where there's job centers and uh, public transportation opportunities if indeed we're going to try to make a dent on our on our housing production uh, both affordable and and uh, otherwise so definitely folks that um, I heard several several times that people are concerned about uh, climate uh, change and, and other issues around that, that uh, dovetail with that. So love to hear their perspective on where, if, if not the corridors, then where do they propose that, that growth to go? So without further ado, we will get into the candidates. Uh, Robert, do you wanna take it from here and introduce folks? Starting right back from from the beginning, we can uh, I guess go to that this uh, sure thing. Yeah, um, Elizabeth Conlin, uh, you have three minutes to talk to us about how you answered these questions. Thank you. Can join us on video. Hello. Yeah, I hope that string of yeses will show everyone that I am serious and I'm committed about solutions to the housing crisis. Um, when asked in the questionnaire whether we supported or did not support, there was also room for some explanation um, to flesh out your answer. So I understand that some of these issues do have nuances and that, you know, it's hard to have a perfect proposal. But on the whole, I think that all of these policies are good for the city of Santa Cruz and push us in the right direction to solving our housing crisis. So starting with um, the question that Robert was most interested in on the mixed use library project, I came around to supporting this project because of those 50 affordable units that will be included in the project. Um, 50 desperately needed low income homes um, are, are definitely something that I am in support of. And I also think it's important to you know, support something that's actually in the pipeline for the city and not just a theoretical consideration. I also support this policy because it is the best, it will result in the best possible library for our project. And I'm afraid that the discussion of the library, which is a vital cultural um, you know, center for our downtown has sort of gotten lost in this conversation about the garage. And while I will concede that the garage is somewhat unexciting for those of us who really do wanna see us taking more drastic steps towards um, being a more sustainable city, um, the truth is, is that that will be needed in order to replace the other surface parking lots downtown that hopefully will be converted into even more affordable housing. And, um, you know, and then when I weigh this, building infill housing is truly the best policy to reduce car use. 
So I think ultimately, even though, you know, the garage may be undesirable to some, I think the net benefit of more housing downtown and really creating, you know, a walkable um, community near where people work, near where they shop will be best for the environment. Um, moving on to the second question, my goal will be to maximize the number of deed restricted affordable homes built. This means that we need to get the percentage right so that developers are building low income units as part of their projects, while also not completely blocking housing options for people. So I'm hoping that with new density bonus legislation that just got passed this year, um, AB 2345, that this will help our 20% um, inclusionary percentage pencil, but if not, I think we should revisit this. I'll also push to remove parking minimums um, for the quarters project, you know, I really hope that my plans to support renters and provide more renter protections, as well as upzone the rest of the city, will get more people um, on board with this sort of transit oriented development that will come from a quarters plan so that, you know, lower income renters don't feel like the burden is only on their neighborhoods and so that the responsibility will be shared across the city. Great, thank you so much, Elizabeth, uh, for your thorough answer. Um, next up, we have Kayla Kumar. Right on, and I'm, I'm sorry, are we answering for all of the questions or just the ones you pulled out? Uh, you, you have three minutes to, okay. to all right. summarize however let's, you will. Let's do it then, okay. So I am not supportive of the current downtown library proposal. First, I wanna share that it is a false choice to say that we can only build affordable housing if we build it alongside 400 parking units. Um, I'm happy to support a project that renovated our library and included more affordable housing. But the truth is, is that there's multiple crises, crises in play, housing and environment. And we must reject projects that falsely claim that you have to choose one or the other. We have to do both. And what's more, there's conflicting evidence that complicates the need for this level of parking infrastructure. Our climate goals, of course, require us um, to do better and have a, a better balance in our approach to reducing car-centric infrastructure and providing real green alternatives. What's more, this project relies on studies that occurred before the pandemic. And on top of that, I'm not clear why this project is prioritized over endeavors such as crisis response and disaster preparedness, et cetera. Um, there are many members of the community as well who have shared with me that they did not vote to tax themselves for a parking garage, but rather a renovated library. And that is a real concern to me in terms of good faith governance. But I will say that the project is moving forward and if it continues through the pipeline, I will be a staunch supporter of maintaining the 100% deed restricted affordable housing for low and moderate income levels. And I invite MBEP to, to join me in that fight. Um, I think the other one you pulled out was the corridors process and I couldn't answer that question because I didn't quite agree with the framing slash needed more context about how the process would continue. Um, if it's in, if it's going to be anything like the first go around, I'm, I, I would vote against a restart because it's just doing the same thing and expecting different results. If the city is ready to humble itself to the community's needs, I'm more than open to the idea of a restart. The corridor plan to me was fundamentally flawed for a few reasons and I'll pull a few out. The first was a lack of meaningful ways for the community input uh, into the design of the project itself. And another one was the inequitable distribution of development um, throughout the city. And so, uh, you know, I think that this particular plan as well has serious gentrifying uh, abilities and there was not clear enough uh, planning to mitigate that. You know, the East Side community brought up really strong concerns around traffic, environment, the environmental impacts, gentrification, affordable housing. Um, so when and if those considerations are actually taken seriously by the city, I would be happy to work day and night to get something put together that can ease our affordability crisis. But the truth is making a bunch of market rate condos for people who think that Santa Cruz is the beach of Silicon Valley is not gonna be a plan I support. This is not the beach of Silicon Valley. This is Santa Cruz, California. We have working people and families that deserve to live here and don't belong less just because they can't, they don't have a million dollars lying around to buy a condo. Great, thanks. Finished right on time, Kayla, appreciate it. Um, next up we have uh, Kelsey Hill. 
Thanks so much. Um, so I will start with the library project. Um, the reason that I am opposed to the library project is because I too am concerned about the amount of parking spaces allotted to the project, especially noting uh, the public opposition and the controversy around it. I don't believe this project moved forward in a good way. Uh, there was a consultant study that was buried because it said things about parking that were contrary to what proponents wanted to believe. Similarly, that lack of transparency was evidenced by the most recent uh, council agenda item on the owner's rep contract. I'd like the city to resume an objective parking inventory before we really make uh, such concrete decisions about our parking demand going forward. Santa Cruz has seen a decrease in parking downtown in the last 12 years, and that rate is not expected to rise. I reject the notion that true sustainability is founded in creating 400 spaces in a downtown space that is already currently very friendly to walkability and human powered and no carbon transportation. Uh, for me, severing the use of cars downtown means creating incentives for that shift. But I will say that, however, as this project moves forward, uh, one way or another, I am most invested in the affordability of those units. And that's the most critical part for me. Um, but I am also opposed to potentially overbuilding parking in our downtown space. I'll move next to the corridor plan. Um, the reason that I abstained from this uh, is because if the corridor plan is revisited, I would first revisit the community and business engagement element of that plan. The reason I abstained again is because I am super interested in public transportation. It's a cornerstone issue for me. Housing has a deeply intersectional relation to our climate action, but I do hear the deep concerns around climbing rents for our business community, those beloved community uh, businesses around the corridors. And I'd like to learn more and have more conversations before committing to a yes or no on this plan. Um, additionally, up zoning, I'm certainly interested in the possibility of uh, different zoning for our residential areas, but I would make this decision dependent on the certain zoning in question with the impact in mind of issues of racial equity, student issues, and access to those public transit lines. And I do want to close by saying because of the severity of this housing crisis, I am aware that we will need to employ multiple approaches to bring in solutions to adequately shelter people and to invest in that long term affordability I mentioned in my presentation. As an elected leader, I will stand up for Santa Cruz residents by supporting affordable and low income housing through community land trusts, advocating for deep affordability in those new projects in the pipeline. And I will approach the housing question with the sense of urgency that it requires. And I will work with my colleagues to get the best deal possible for the folks that are threatened by the rising cost of living here in Santa Cruz. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Really appreciate the thoroughness. And again, finishing on time, really appreciate that. Uh, next up, we have Maria Cadenas. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everybody, again, for uh, joining tonight. Um, I'll just go down the line, if, if that's OK with people. Uh, in terms of the library project, I think this is a complex issue, um, simply because of, well, uh, uh, because of how it, it was structured and the process that it took. Uh, my decision on the library project is based on where it currently stands in the current proposal that includes uh, affordable housing units that are, are part of it. And the other part of it is that the parking structure itself uh, could be, the majority of it could be converted into additional housing in the future. When I think about Santa Cruz and I think about downtown, I think of downtown as a commercial and cultural center for the city. And I really believe that uh, part of that requires mixed use buildings. Um, we also have a housing crisis. That means that any opportunity we have to look at housing, we should embrace it and, and move forward with it. In this case, we have an opportunity to have the culture center downtown with people who, in essence, otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it to live downtown. And I think that's valuable. The other piece is that we've got to look at it long term as a strategy for that space of downtown. It's an opportunity to cement it the parking needs for the city and really look at the surface lots as, as future sites for housing, look at the old library site as future sites for housing. And having that parking structure means that the current other parking structures could also, who are aging, could also then be converted into additional housing down the future. So I, I really see it as a strategy to use our downtown as much as we can um, as part of a, a living, walkable community that moves towards sustainability over a period of time. No one project can do it on its own. Uh, in terms of the corridor plan, um, the reason I have seen it, it really was similar to Kayla. It's around the framing of the question. 
I believe strongly that there is um, a need to look at uh, how we look at the corridors um, as an opportunity for housing. It really depends on the mix of housing types that would be there and the community process whose voices are included, but also looking at other areas of the city. Um, similar, like Elizabeth said, we, we gotta be looking at land use and zoning rules across the city, approach it with a balanced approach and not put the burden only in certain areas. Um, that said, I still think downtown is a great area for us to look at housing and the corridors offer an, offer an opportunity if it is utilized with an equity frame. Uh, in regards to the rent control question and rental protections, I'm a strong advocate for rental protections. Um, I do believe that the policies passed at the state level are adequate and appropriate. If we are looking for more local ordinances, I'm in support of that as long as they are thoughtful, part of an inclusive, holistic approach that protects both tenants and landowners and makes sense given our housing mix where we have so many single family homes. And, and then they balance out with the laws that we have at the state level. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Maria. And again, I'm loving this trend of finishing right on time. Let's hope we can keep it going. Uh, next up, if we could move the slide forward, um, we have uh, Martine Watkins. Hey, I'm gonna try to keep it going here, thank you. Um, so I guess a few things I just wanna point out really quickly in terms of affordability. I wanna highlight some of the policies that have been vetted by the community as solutions they'd like to see us move forward with. One is how are we legalizing unpermitted and red, red tag dwelling units and really protecting the existing housing stock we have? How are we streamlining ADU production and looking at potentially creating pre-approved ADU plans for efficiency? How are we also better encouraging affordable housing development? And that gets into looking at our fees and our fee waivers. As we look at inclusionary percentages, how are we using data to inform that percentage? It's a delicate balance to have inclusionary percentages that don't um, that get the maximum amount of affordability while also not discouraging development. And then also looking at our parking um, holistically as it relates to neighborhood parking requirements, but also in terms of consolidated parking in our downtown. And they also supported if we were to grow anywhere, it's to grow in our downtown. And so I wanna to continue to find ways to work with industries to build our, our workforce um, housing, as well as looking at how we can use this opportunity with some of the larger spaces we have in our downtown to convert potentially aspects of those spaces into um, SRO units or other small uh, living units. In regards to briefly going through the questions, as a current city council member, I've, um, I recognize that this has been a challenging uh, topic for a number of folks, but after two uh, separate groups uh, comprised of many uh, uh, experts as well as community members and, and thoughtful processes, they all landed with this is the best uh, proposal to move forward. And so I've supported that proposal. Um, in regards to thinking about the, uh, it's, uh, the uh, inclusionary ordinance, I think we need to make that data informed until we have a new nexus study to help us better understand what that percentage should be. I will um, wait until that happens. And um, thinking about the affordable housing on the corridors, I too, um, was the framing of the question, essentially state law came in and said, you need to adhere to your general plan. So right now what we're doing is we're looking at how are we, how are we using some of the state funding to have design plan standards so that they match neighborhood compatibility and, and feel. Um, and renter protections as well, thinking about how we as a community can also build on some of the state protections. Those are coming out on a regular basis. We know statewide nationally that we need to keep people housed. We need to draw down resources as well as utilize our own. And anything really beyond that needs to go into um, a major uh, discussion around how uh, voters can weigh in on terms of rent control. And then I guess I'll just uh, say for the upzoning, we have a general plan in process right now. We're using that plan to um, be able to move forward with housing solutions. We're gonna start a new process to, um, to update that plan. And until then, I think we just need to adhere to that plan. But as a current city council and former mayor, I feel I have a track rec record uh, of supporting housing and mobilizing our uh, community to support housing solutions. And I wanna continue to do that. Thank you very much. Great, great. Right on time again. Uh, let's see if we can keep that trend going. Uh, next up, we have Sonia Bruner. Thank you, Robert. 
I currently serve on the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners and through the Housing Authority, we have supported housing needs and applied for inflation adjusted rent subsidies and expanded the number of vouchers for different programs. And we're able to establish a landlord incentive program that encourages landlords to accept vouchers from the Section 8 housing program. The Section 8 program currently has around 400 individuals or families that are program eligible and have rent vouchers in hand trying to find units to rent, but many are not having success. This is an example that we need housing period. I've consistently demonstrated my commitment to creating exclusive and equitable solutions for our community through decades of civic engagement, serving on the housing board, small business work and collaborations. And I truly believe that all of this and the community partnerships will be, be an asset as a council member. As a renter and someone who was in the low income public housing program for eight years after six year wait on the waiting list, as well as my seven years time served on the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners, I'm really committed to increasing housing options. And truly, I understand the need to advocate for affordable housing resources and advocate for funding federal and state level grants housing trusts, etc. I'm running for city council as my commitment to support Santa Cruz as an invested community member. And I look forward to serving and supporting housing options, safety and success of Santa Cruz. I would be honored to have your vote. And my name is Sonia Brunner. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Sonia. Um, next up, we have council member Sandy Brown. All right, thank you. Uh, still Sandy Brown, um, still supporting affordable housing uh, in any and all ways. I just wanna make a comment really quickly. First, that um, I just, I, my perspective I think is, is quite a bit different and I've talked with some of you about this, uh, Matt, Robert and others. Um, I just don't believe that housing production is gonna bring us affordability unless we demand it and, um, and we incentivize it. So, you know, the arc of uh, supply and demand has not been towards affordability in a community like ours that is a desirable place to live, uh, has, you know, tremendous speculative investment interest uh, moving in. Uh, it's just not possible. So for me, it's all about um, finding ways to get afford affordable housing built and not just market housing and hope that it will eventually become affordable. So um, in terms of the downtown library, um, I was the actually the uh, library committee member who uh, conditioned the recommendation coming out of our committee on those 50 units and the maximum 400 uh, parking spaces. And I did that because throughout the process, we were told that, um, th you know, of course, this is possible. And, um, you know, we're, yeah, we're going to have affordable housing. I mean, people were saying 80, 120, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. And so I wanted to try to put something in there to um, clarify and, you know, and, and ensure that um, we'd get affordable units in that project. At the end of the day, we did not receive any uh, financial information suggesting that that would be possible. Um, so the way uh, to get an additional uh, 2,500 or 3,000 square feet for the library is dependent upon selling air rights, which would make it impossible to uh, build affordable units. Um, nonprofit developers cannot afford to, to do that. So um, I just couldn't, at the end of the day, support a project that um, was, was really going to expand our car-centric infrastructure in the downtown. I realize surface lots are coming offline, but I don't. I believe that um, you know there's much more study to be done, and the circumstances have changed. Um, so I, I um, more to say, but I'll leave it there. Um, with respect, and I do want to say, uh, supporting projects conforming to the existing inclusionary ordinance, that I would have said yes. But the whole package of density bonus and kind of some of the other issues that were in the question um, caused me to abstain and and suggest that. Um, my, my support for those would be really conditioned upon maximizing affordability. And so there's a big debate about uh, what, how we deal with the um, density bonus um, and the, the inclusionary housing uh, rules. Um, and so, you know, I think that if we could, if we could get, a, get around that, then we'd actually be able to do something. I want to continue by saying I, um, 
was the person who, uh, the council member who moved to do a reset on the corridors process, I would not support anything like the process that we uh, went through before. Um, and, uh, you know, that is really about, it was a plan to, um, by developers and our planning department and without meaningful uh, neighborhood engagement. And I think we absolutely need that to move forward. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Appreciate throwing us in response. And while we may have had differing uh, discussions in the past, uh, I'm really glad you could be here and share your perspective with us. Um, next up, we have uh, Sheber Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Robert. Um, so we can all agree that the impacts of COVID and the fires on our community have been devastating and have affected people's housing. Um, now is the time to say yes to housing and we have to do this in a thoughtful way that includes authentic and diverse community input. So I'll provide some further points on my survey responses. Uh, in terms of the library project, the project was approved based on a unanimous recommendation of this, the council committee that studied the concept for a year. Um, it will bring, as been mentioned, it will bring uh, 50 new apartments. It'll facilitate the development of additional affordable apartments, which we have all agreed is needed more than ever now. And it will replace downtown parking where we will build housing on surface lots. And I've done a little digging here. And what I've learned is that it actually will increase, we'll have an increase of 31 parking spaces for the overall district when we account the surface lots that will be taken. Um, and this isn't considered a new net in supply of parking. Um, and of course, it will create a first class library and community center for our youth and our families and our seniors. The alternative of renovating the existing library would have had 5,000 fewer square feet and have to lose some important library functions and cost millions of additional dollars. Uh, I'll move on to the inclusionary project. I do support inclusionary projects and uh, we have to assess if the 20% inclusionary requirement is feasible. Um, I'd like to see what the studies show us. And I'm concerned that if it's too expensive to build, if it becomes too expensive to build, we may lose the opportunity for any housing units. And we really can't afford that. I'd explore options such as making some inclusionary housing units section eight. This would allow for affordable units without lowering the rent for developers and making projects more economically feasible. Um, in regards to the general plan amendment, including the corridors, I would prioritize mixed use housing in the downtown areas and on existing city owned lands and spaces. And <laughs> there's always an and distribution of new housing sites must be fair to all sections of the community. Uh, as part of the city general plan update, we should explore all options and make sure that we maintain neighborhood compatibility. Uh, building along the corridor and neighborhoods and business districts will need community input. It will need thoughtful consideration and inclusive and transparent planning. Um, around rent control, additional tenant protection city ordinances make sense if it's demonstrated that state law is not sufficiently protecting Santa Cruz renters. And if that were the case, local measures would need to be voted on by city residents. Um, and I do think increasing affordable housing stock is essential to addressing our high, our high rents. Um, and around upzoning, um, again, we have to explore our, all options to increase our housing in Santa Cruz. Um, we can do this thoughtfully. Uh, we can do this without impacting our natural environment or the aesthetic sense of our community or impacting our quality of life. Um, and we can start through the revision of our general plan and again, really ensure community engagement and input in every step of the process. So as I stated in my opening comments, my vision for Santa Cruz is a healthy, diverse and inclusive community in which all of our residents live with dignity. Housing is an essential component to operationalizing this vision. Um, so I hope that uh, you will join me and we can make this vision happen. Thank you so much for the opportunity tonight. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the candidates. Thank you, Shebra, for that wonderful response. Um, if we could all just really quickly have a, a virtual hand for our candidates, all for both first supervisors, Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz, really appreciate you all being here with us tonight. Um, we've learned a lot about housing and how it how it's manifested over each of your various jurisdictions and kind of the different levers that are available to us um, and the different issues that have been discussed. Um, I think, you know, key differences, especially for the Santa Cruz City Council were stances in the library. Um, uh, also talk about the importance of public outreach and making sure that we have community buy-in for future housing, for future housing solutions. And on whatever side of the spectrum you stand for in terms of 
uh, market rate housing and how that plays a part in housing affordability generally. Uh, just want to say the way you help make housing solutions a reality is to get involved in the local level, it's to attend meetings, it's to follow the issues, it's to track which projects are being built near you and to make sure your voice is heard and get involved. So again, wherever you stand in the political spectrum about housing affordability, there is an outlet for you to have a constructive and meaningful impact in your community. And thank you again for all the candidates for being here tonight and for talking about these different kinds of ideas. Matt, do you have anything to add? Absolutely, man. Just a little bit of pile on to that. Um, on community engagement, you know, um, especially now with, with COVID and, and having virtual meetings, I know not everybody has the same um, access connectivity or devices and stuff. And that's on an ongoing challenge in terms of our now new infrastructure needs that, that we have to deal with. Um, but, you know, I want to believe that uh, where developers, nonprofit, for profits, uh, so the private sector and the public sector really needs to continue doing better at community engagement and encouraging more public participation, whether it's in small committees, um, you know, joining online, even calls, surveys, taking surveys, survey monkeys are the easiest thing. So things can get done even during this really challenging time where we have to maintain social distance and, and, um, and be safe. Uh, but I want to encourage everybody to think outside the box when when trying to really reach out to communities, whether we're talking about specific projects that that are proposed or even policies so that we get the, the best thinking from from all corners of, of each of our, our respective communities. Um, and so MBEP is definitely a, a player in that. I want uh, you guys to help make sure that that you encourage um, not only everybody here, but but your your friends, others that are engaged to join us and participate in our action center when we send out alerts we you know very um, you know agnostic about uh, who we're who we're working with we really want to make sure that you know if you're if you have a strong housing agenda and you want to see more uh, affordable housing and more supply and, and addressing these needs that we have in our community um, to go beyond not only just meeting our regional housing needs ass uh, assessment goals but but exceeding them because we know that those are, are looking backward and don't address the, the pent up demands and needs and overcrowding situations and so forth that, that um, are, are increasing challenges in our community. So again, wanna just thank everybody. Thank you, Robert, for joining me. Thanks, Tim, who wasn't able to, to uh, be here right now the second, but uh, certainly um, helped craft a lot of the, the format and the, the program. I wanna thank our team, the MBEP team behind the scenes, um, We'll make this happen. Uh, Emmy, Alexia, Maya, Kate, Raphael, and others who, who help uh, make this, this uh, evening happen as well. Um, we wish everybody a, a safe um, rest of the election, and um, we'll see, see you on the other side. Take care, everybody. Good evening. Good luck for retirement, Julie Conway. And Julie, another here's, I'm going to go drink something for Julie right now. All right. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care. Wonderful Good night. night. Bye. Bye. Bye.